So overcoming challenges. This is not unique to agility, but it works brilliantly for agility. Any of you who have followed my podcast or have been a student of ours, you would have heard this acronym before. And the acronym is D-A-S-H. And this is something I've been teaching for 25 years or 30 years, how to overcome challenges. So let's apply this to start lines and contacts. So the D, the first thing is your dog's desire. Does the dog want to be there? Does the dog want to train with you? Does the dog love what you're doing? Or does your dog love it too much? So you don't have calm focus. So we've got to dial that in. Now, it could be your dog isn't feeling well, not feeling well. So they could be in pain. We can't train a dog that's in pain, guys. My good friend, uh, I like to call her my good friend. We've actually only met once. But she's a fellow Canadian, so I call her my good friend, Jean Donaldson. She has a great approach to dog training. I mean, she's brilliant. And she says the first thing we have to decide when we're overcoming a challenge is, is there an emotional component? So if your dog is crazed and can't focus, that's an emotional component. If your dog is afraid, so they're overexcited or over aroused and they can't focus. Now I'm gonna put an asterisk beside this one because a lot of times this isn't what it appears. But if you have a dog and you put them on the start line and they're afraid of other dogs and other dogs are walking behind them, you can't dog train fear guys. You have to work as a counter conditioning exercise from an emotional standpoint, right? So is your dog's lack of desire to train from you, is it caused by they're not feeling well and you can say, no, he's always like that. Well, maybe he's been not feeling well for a very long time. That's what I was dealt with with my now two-year-old dog, this. She just didn't feel well for a very long time. And it took me all, well over a year to dial in exactly what our challenge was. Okay, so move no further. No sense going to agility class and getting your dog on uh, contacts or ask them to do a tunnel if you don't have desire. That is the fundamentals to all dog training. And the lack of desire could show up by your dog uh, scratching or stress yawning or they sniff. You might get them to pay attention for a bit and then they leave. The lack of desire quite often in dog agility comes from we overwhelm the dogs. They are so overwhelmed and frustrated by not being able to do what you want them to do. The dog might be overwhelmed because let's say you taught them how to do a jump or a tunnel with a toy out in front or a cookie out in front. And now they don't understand because the cookie's not there at the trial. I don't know how to do a seesaw now because there's no peanut butter at the end. And so a dog gets overwhelmed when we change from what they saw when we were teaching the foundations of it and we transitioned to, oh, this is a dog agility now. Years ago, I was at a massive big school. They had no paint down the middle of their contacts. No paint down the middle of the dog walk, no paint down the middle of the seesaw, no paint down the middle of the A-frame. I couldn't figure out until somebody told me, oh, that's because they teach all their dogs by putting squeeze cheese on all the contacts and the dogs just lick their way along the contacts. So that's why there's no paint there because the dogs just lick all the contacts. They've licked the paint off while they're licking the squeeze cheese. What has that got to do with teaching a dog agility? Right? So you've got to look at the big thing. Number one, we move no further. Does my dog want to be there? Is my dog engaged enough to want? How do you know? You can tell by their body language. Our dogs are so clear, so transparent. All right, the next thing, the A, that's the accuracy of any behavior. So the accuracy of how to teach weep poles, the accuracy of how to stay at the start line, that involves criteria. Criteria are the rules of the game. So there are rules to how you do a seesaw. There are rules. You make them up. You make them up. 
when I say you make them up, my hallucination is most of you watching this have some sort of instructor who guides your development of what that criteria is. Ideally, I, and I saw several of you from our programs from Handling 360 and Agility Nation. So I'm gonna put an asterisk beside this one. So how I ask my dog to do a skill when they are at home, it involves this. When I ask you to sit at the start line, it doesn't involve moving your feet a little bit. It doesn't involve you paddling or you standing or you getting in a position ready to go. And you go, oh yeah, 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 I'm really good with that. Does that criteria, is it the same every single time you do it? If it is, you have no problem. You know, I did a, a podcast, I think it was last year, where I figured out approximately how many start lines I've done with my 10 agility dogs over my 30 years, including all the times I've trained those agility dogs. Now to keep this in perspective, my current dog, I train two to three times a day, all right? It's a lot of dog training. So I don't know, I think I guess somewhere around 15,000 start lines that I've done with all my dogs. Guess how many my dogs have broke in competition or in practice? I could count it on one hand. All 10 dogs have broke their start line less than five times. I'm good at setting, establishing, and following through with criteria. Those of you watching might do running contacts. What is your criteria? Now, if you go, oh, I just want my dog to, to like touch the yellow. That's vague. Vague criteria equals zero criteria. Criteria has got to be, what's in your mind, it's, it doesn't matter. What does your dog think the criteria is? That's how they perform it when they're excited, when they're overwhelmed with all of the people there. That's your dog's understanding of your criteria, okay? The next thing is the speed. Speed often comes by starting with desire and then training criteria in step-by-step -step approach. So let's say my dog seesaw. My dog doesn't like the seesaw. Well, there's, I think, 12 different behaviors that come together for a seesaw. What part doesn't your dog like? Does your dog not like the landing? Does he not like the noise? Does he not like the tip? Does he not like, there's so many different things. Have you broken this down? I remember when I first started agility, I was taught to um, get the dog on the seesaw and hold the seesaw so it didn't tip and then give them a cookie when they got in the middle and then slowly lower the seesaw and give them a cookie when they got to the end. So the dogs didn't make any decisions. No. That is not at all any way, shape, and form look like what we do now, but how can the dog learn to be fast when they really don't understand how to perform the task, right? And the final thing, the H, is the habitat, and that is the environment. What is the environment like that you've trained the behavior? Have you kept the same criteria in every environment. So you may, oh yeah, I train at class and we always put um, a little pit of a margarine lid with some cookies on it for the dog walk. But when you go to, so the criteria you think is your dog stopping and your dog thinks is your, the criteria is eat. And when there's no snacks available, just go, right? So is the criteria something the dog understands how to do it in all habitats? Trials outside, trials inside, trials on turf, trials on dirt. So I know that when I, I, I trained stop contacts, I used to teach my dogs to touch their nose to the ground. I had to teach them to put their nose in dirt because I trialed on dirt, All right? So that is a simple formula.